pretty cow sat the two section four bye so section four and five we're gonna look at complex numbers as section four uh, and a lot of review and then we're also going to do some solving finding zeros with the complex numbers that's actually section five as well these first three problems if we look at factoring this first one here um, just review we should be able to factor a negative 2x out. You should always look for a GCF first. Don't think you have to break it up into the two binomials. Here you're just pulling out a single term, a monomial. And then we're going to get uh, x minus 4 left in the parentheses. Always look for that GCF first. The second one you can look to factor. And you have the x and the x. And I'd actually look at the right here, plus 2 and plus 1 are the only ways to get this 2 here. And then I can go back and try to figure out what two numbers multiply by 12 that would work here. But if I look at all my combinations, none of them is going to give me an OI value that's 1. So it's not factorable. So then I go right to the quadratic formula. So negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c all over double a. And now I would simplify that. Now notice when you're doing this problem, negative 1 plus or minus the issue with this one, we're going to be doing 48, 96, 1 minus 96, so a negative 95. And so we're going to be talking about that today, what happens when we get this negative part underneath the radical. And the last one here, another method is uh, using completing the square to solve that. And so since I have an a value of 1, then I can just go ahead and complete the square. So 8x plus, uh, or in half of that's 4, 4 squared is 16. And then if I want to have it equal 0, I can subtract the 9. Uh, so you can see the full equation when I find the zeros. And so this factors. Oh, I have to also add 16 to the side. So I have to then factor it x plus 4, the quantity squared, equals 7. And then I can square root both sides. So x plus 4 equals plus or minus root 7. And so x is negative 4 plus or minus root 7. And really, completing the square becomes a really nice method for solving these. Uh, I actually prefer over quadratic formulas unless the numbers get really nasty. So in, in section 4, we're really talking about that i value, and it comes from the square root of negative 1. Square root of negative 1 is i. And some dude a long time ago just said, let's call this i and see what happens. And we, can, we can't really deal with this number. And the reason why is uh, the square root of a number, we'll call that square root of x, the answer to that is going to be a if a times a equals x squared. But there's no number that's times itself that's going to give me a negative value. So like the answer here to get a negative 1, no number times itself is going to be negative because a negative times a negative is positive. So that will never occur. That's what we call it imaginary. But we can uh, allow it to be called i so we can see what happens in the future. So these are called complex numbers when we start dealing with i. So the standard form of a complex number is a plus bi, always written in this form. Uh, the a portion is called the real portion. The B is the imaginary portion, so they have two parts to that, the two terms. A real number can be written as like uh, where B is 0, the imaginary part of 0, would just be the A value. A pure imaginary number is just going to be the BI, there's a A value be 0. Now we're looking at I's. I is a square root of negative 1. Not very interesting there because there's no value to that we, we know of. So I squared here would be a square root of negative 1 times the square root of negative 1. And we've talked about this in pe previous sections, like the square root of 2 times the square root of 2 is 2. And this holds true for all the values. The square root of x times the square root of x is x squared. So here, the square root of negative 1 times the square root of negative 1 is negative 1. So we went from a number that was imaginary to a real number. And that's where using i helps us out, because even though we have imaginary solutions that we really can't find values to, if we start squaring them, then we can start getting imaginary numbers. i cubed is the same thing as i squared times i. And again, i squared is negative 1, so we just get negative i. i to the fourth is i squared times i squared, which is negative 1 times negative 1, or 1. These four numbers are the four numbers that they keep repeating, so it's a pattern i, i squared, i cubed, i fourth, i to the fifth is the same as i because it's like i to the fourth times i. i to the sixth would be like i squared, i to the seventh like i cubed, i to the eighth is like i to the fourth, and so forth. 
So we're going to look at operations with complex numbers. And all you're doing is treat i as a variable. So for this problem, we're subtracting. So distribute the negative through here. So you get 3 plus 4i minus 5 plus 2i. Combine like terms, so negative 2 plus 7i, and we're done. Just treat i as a variable. For this one, 5 minus 3i squared, we've got to be careful here. If you still struggle with this as being a foiling problem, then expand it. So now we can foil it. So we have 25, and then the last term will be 9i squared. So I did the first and the last. Then I'm looking at oi is these two multiplied together and added. So it's a negative 15 and negative 15 or negative 30i. And so now here is the only new thing for simplifying. We have i squared here. i squared we top out as a negative 1. So we can keep simplifying this a little bit further. This is really negative 1 times 9, which is negative 9. So we have negative 9 and 25. And we have a negative 30i. So we really have 16 minus 30i. And we combine the 25 minus 9. So that's all the operations. So that's all the operations. Now we can look at dealing with complex conjugates. Uh, a plus bi and a minus bi are called conjugates. We've also looked at, at these as difference of perfect squares. We call them those in the past. But the product yields a real number. And that's the nice thing about here with complex numbers. These are conjugates because if you multiply these, you get a real number. So we can write, use that to write some of these in, in uh, standard form. When we have a complex value in a denominator. We want to multiply the top and bottom by the conjugate of the denominator. So if you look at the denominator, 2 minus i, the conjugate is going to be 2 plus i. So you multiply the top by that as well. We have to multiply by a value of 1. If we do that, so the oi value is 0 here when we foil the denominator. And we're not done yet because we still have these i squares. We have them on the numerator and the denominator. So they're both negative 1 and negative 1. So we have to be careful. This is a 4 minus a negative 1. So on the denominator, we get 5. The top, we have 4 here minus 1. So we get 3 plus 4i. So the last step then is to rewrite this as two fractions. So we have 3 over 5 plus 4i over 5. Now you can see the like the a plus b i form, so you have the real and the imaginary portion. So this would be the standard form for that complex number. So you have to uh, get the i out of the denominator. Is kind of what we're doing. So two five. Some of the theorems, the fundamental theorem of algebra, says that if f of x is a polynomial of degree n, where n is greater than or equal to zero, so you have some degree value even one then f has at least one zero in the complex set. just means you're going to have some kind of zero, some kind of solution. Uh, X-intercept root, it may be imaginary, but you have at least one. Linear factorization theorem is if f of x is a polynomial of degree n, where n is greater than zero, then the function has precisely n linear factors. So you can take and write those roots or zeros as factors. You'll always have the same number as you have powers. They may be repeats, they may be imaginary, but you'll have the same amount of factors as you have, as you have a, a degree. Complex zeros occur in conjugate pairs. So if you have a plus bi, where b is not zero, which means you have an imaginary portion to that. If that is a zero, then you automatically know that a minus bi is also a zero. If you have a and if you have some kind of imaginary solution that's conjugate will also be the zero. So that one is kind of a huge one for us to, to help us write. Now, all the rest of the section is is taking it and really finding the zeros that we did previously, but just, they might be imaginary or complex. So how many zeros are there for this? Again, it's the degree. We have five zeros uh, or factors or roots. The possible rational zeros, this is what we really didn't talk about because we use a calculator to do it. So <clears throat> I can find that by taking the factors of 54, the last number, and dividing by the factors of the leading coefficient. And so you can just list them out. But again, we just use the calculator to graph that. So, we're, so 
So if you graph this, I know that it's going to cross over here, it comes back down, it touches down here, and it goes up. And I just graphed it in my calculator, and it looks like negative 3 and 3, I believe. But negative 3 and 3 is where it crosses the x-axis. So we're going to take those two values in that polynomial, and we can synthetic divide to see if they are 0. So I'm going to finish this to our polynomial. Now we can synthetic divide by negative 3. So drop the 1, multiply, add, multiply, add, multiply, add, negative 12, multiply, 36, add, 18, and then we multiply, and, we, and then we multiply, and we get negative 54. So that is a 0. Now the other 0 is a 3. And that was actually a special one because it was also a turning point. So let's synthetic divide by that. So multiply negative 9. 2 multiplies. Add. Multiply. We get another 0. And this is our remainder, so we're not using this one. Now because that was a double root, it is a turning point, it's a double root, I'm going to synthetic divide by that again. So 0 multiply. Add, multiply, add, so right there. So these are all zeros, so that's where we get these are our zeros, but we should have five of them. So what's left over here is that there's a constant, there's our x, there's our x squared, so this is x squared plus 0x plus 2 is what's left over. We need to take that portion and then uh, find all the zeros solving quadratics. So we had an x squared plus 2 that was left over, we need to find the rest of the zeros using our quadratic knowledge. For this, because we only have x squared, we don't have x squared and x, I would set it equal to 0 because we're finding the zeros. Subtract 2 to both sides, then square root. When we square root both sides, the square root of a negative 2 is plus or minus because we square root both sides, but it's the square root of 2 we don't know, but the square root of the negative is an i, we put that out in front. Don't put it in front of the plus or minus, put it in front of the root. If you put in front of the plus or minus, then now it's an i plus or minus root 2. But that i is multiplying to the square root of 2. So now, uh, our original question, uh, question was find all the zeros. This is two of them. We also have 3, 3, and negative 3. So these are the five zeros. Now if I ask for the linear factors, I can write them as like x minus 3 squared, x plus 3, and I could write these as linear factors would be like x minus i root plus i root 2. Those would be the linear factors. Linear meaning that these all have to be degree 1. This is degree 1 even though you have two of them. This is called the multiplicity of 2, so it means we have two of the same factor. So last problem here, uh, we're going to write the fourth degree polynomial in general form and it has these zeros, a zero of negative 3 with multiplicity 2 and then a 1 plus i. Now because it has a con, uh, complex solution, we should realize that if it has 1, it automatically has the conjugate. So the conjugate is 1 minus i. So it doesn't state it, but you have to write it. They're both going to be zeros. So our zeros are negative 3, another negative 3 because of multiplicity 2, 1 plus i, and then 1 minus i. These are the four zeros. So you don't put those in factored form, it would be x plus 3 squared, and then it's going to be x, the opposite, or minus, we'll say, the quantity of 1 plus i. And we also have x minus, parenthesis, 1 minus i. And so this ends up we simplify the last two, distribute the negative, we get x minus 1 minus i and x minus 1 plus i. And so these would be the factors of that polynomial. Now we could go through the mess of multiplying these together and then uh, distributing and foiling and then distributing. Now this one's a pain to do, uh, but sometimes I will ask you to write it in general form. And that's just putting it uh, in the, by, by multiplying and distributing things. So the video problem, I want you to just do a very similar thing. I want you to write the fourth degree polynomial given these zeros below. 
So it should be easy peasy. We'll call that it for the night. Have a good night. See you tomorrow.